بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونؤمن به ونتوكل عليه ونعوذ بالله من شرور انفسنا ومن سيئات اعمالنا من يهد الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلا هادي له ونشهد ان سيدنا ونبينا ومولانا محمد عبده ورسوله وصلى الله تبارك وتعالى عليه وعلى اله وصحبه وبارك وسلم تسليما كثيرا كثيرا اما بعد فاعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم in last week's lesson i mentioned four usuls four principles derived by the ulama by the scholars to determine whether a particular dress or whether a particular garment is permissible is lawful to wear whether it is impermissible to wear and the four usuls or the four principles i mentioned was number 1 the dress or the garment has to be such that it covers our body it covers our aura and satar number 2 the dress or the garment has to be decent has to look presentable has to be something which is apparently looks nice and i quoted the hadith from sunan at-tirmizi last week as well that there was once a sahabi who was walking around with dusty dirty clothing so rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam asked him that do you have wealth do you have money so that sahabi that companion replied by saying that yes so prophet of allah i have gold so i have camels i have horses i have gold i have silver so then rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam replied by saying fal yura athru ni'mati alayka which means if allah has blessed you with wealth and money then why don't you make that blessing appearable or apparent upon you In other words then buy something decent buy some clothes or garments or dresses which is deep decent and then wear it so you then thank and you show Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's blessings upon you so that was the second usul i mentioned the third usul was that the clothes or the dresses or garments we wear has to be such that it represents our muslim identity that we are not wearing clothes which represents or which imitates other religions or other people as allah says in the holy quran wa may yu'azzim sha'ir allah that whoever respects the symbols or the signs of allah now symbols or signs of allah could mean the masajid it could mean azan it could be the hijab it could be the niqab meaning things which when a person was to see will associate that with islam similarly clothing kurta jubba libas topi these kind of things these are all clothes which a person will associate with islam so the ayat al mubarakah says that whoever shows respect to the signs or symbols of allah fa innaha min taqwa al qulub it is a sign that that person's got piety and taqwa and the fourth usul i went on to mention is that the clothes or the garments which we wear has to be such that it doesn't show off there's no sign of arrogance or pride or vanity or these kind of things so these were the four usuls i mentioned in last week's lesson now in this week's lesson i'm going to begin with something which i started briefly in last week's lesson about the dress or the kameez or the kurta of rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam what rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam wo now it's mentioned in a hadith which can be found in shamail at-tirmizi now shamail at-tirmizi is a very famous book has a sheikh rahimullah has also done a commentary of this particular book as well in english you find some copies around probably there may be a copy here as well 
And this is such a book which talks about the characteristics and the awsafs and the attributes of Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam. So you won't find any hadiths about, say, other things, just about Aap sallallahu alaihi wasallam's appearance, akhlaq, manners, what he wore, wagera wagera. So there's a chapter there about the clothes Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam wore, and in that hadith is mentioned that the kurta or the shirt of Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam, the sleeves were up to his wrists. Number two, it's also mentioned that his the the neckline was up to his chest, like our kurta, we have the neckline up to the chest. And it's also mentioned that sometimes Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam would keep his the button on the qameez uh, and on the kurta open. And then it's mentioned in another hadith. This is slightly moving away from the topic, but I'm just mentioning this to show how staunch the sahabas were when it came to following the sunnah. In another hadith, it's mentioned that Hazrat ibn Umar anhu, who was the son of Hazrat Umar anhu. And what's so beautiful about Hazrat Ibn Umar is that whatever he saw Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam do, he never looked at any ta'wil or interpretation that, oh, yeah, mustab hai, yeah, sunnat hai, or this is muba. Because Aap Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam did it, he then continued doing it for the rest of the life. So it's mentioned in another hadith that Ibn Umar anhu, whether it was cold outside, like snow or something, or whether it was warm or hot, he would always leave his the button on his collar open. Why? Because he saw Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam do it. So whether he was freezing cold outside, it didn't matter. He would have his collar button open. Whether he was hot outside, even then he will have it open. So basically, that's why he's mentioned the hadith of Shamali Tirmizi. Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam's sleeves would be up to the wrist. Then the the neckline was up to his chest. He would also have the the color button uh, open as well, which then leads to another hadith, which is also found in that section of a famous Sahabi in the name of Hazrat Salman Farsi radhiyallahu And it's mentioned the background to this particular hadith is that Hazrat Salman Farsi radhiyallahu and there's some virtues of Hazrat Salman Farsi because Hazrat Salman radhiyallahu was from Persia. He was a non-Arab. And once one of the Sahabas asked Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam the tafsir of wa akhirina minhum lamma yalhaqu bihim, which is in Surah Jumu'ah, about those people who haven't reached us yet. So it's mentioned in Sahih al-Bukhari that Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam placed his hands on Hazrat Salman radhiyallahu and said that if Deen was to reach Suraya. Suraya is a name of a star, a very far away star. So in other words, Absalullah is saying that if Deen was to reach far, far away lands, there would be some men or a man similar to Hazrat Salman Farsi anhu who would do a lot of khidmat for the Deen, who would help the Deen a lot. And this hadith is of Sahih al-Bukhari and the reason I'm mentioning this here as well is that there's this perception nowadays that many people just respect Arab scholars and our scholars meaning like our ulama Dawband, people don't respect as much they say well he's an Arab he's the Imam of Haramain we should respect him we should listen to him you know he's a scholar of Arabia he's an Arab they know the religion more better than say a non-Arab somebody brought up in a village in Pakistan, India. What this hadith says is actually there will be people who are non-Arabs, they would be doing khidmat of deen more than Arabs. And that's why when you look at all these hadith books, Sahih al-Bukhari, Sahih Muslim, Sunan al-Tirmizi, you know the narrate, you know the authors of these books, like take Imam Bukhari. Is Imam Bukhari from Arabia? Is he from Makkah? Is he from Medina? No, Imam Bukhari is from Uzbekistan. He's from there. So even the people nowadays who talk about or oh, Arabs and they the ones and so on, they're actually using hadith books written by non-Arabs. The Sahih al-Bukhari, Imam Bukhari is a non-Arab. 
Imam Tirmizi is a non-Arab. Imam Abu Dawood, they are all non-Arabs. Uh, so this notion people have, in particular with the youngsters that are oh, our ulamas, they don't really know as much like, compared to the Arabs, it's totally wrong. And actually when you look at it, when you look at our ulama Dawban, and if you want to include Tablid Jamaati as well, the only Nazid you can find, the only similarity you can find is of the Sahabas, where the same way Sahaba spread the deen to all four corners of the world. Similarly, the ulama Dawban and along with the Tablid Jamaat, they're the only true living example nowadays where because of them, deen has spread to all four corners of the world. Look at other sects. You, you, know, you won't find you know, someone like you know, this particular sect in this particular country. But you go wherever in the world, you will find someone. There may be someone who's just teaching some kids in a madrasa. But he will be somehow connected to Dalum Dawban. Like he's studying in a madrasa, which was from Dalum Dawban. So what I'm trying to say is that the ulama Dawban and obviously the, they have done so much khidmat for deen. So this kind of notion which people say, oh, it's just the Arabs, they know the deen more better than non-Arabs and so on. is totally that notion or that belief totally contradicts the hadith here where Absalullah has said that if deen was to reach these faraway lands, their iman and their faith will be so strong that they'll do so much khidmat for deen. And we even see this nowadays as well with some reverts, where some reverts, you know, they may, they're from Italy or France, whatever. They just been Muslims for a few years, but they do so much effort for deen more than you and I. So this like notion that Arabs know the deen more than non-Arabs, this notion that those who are born as Muslims know deen more than, say, reverts, it's not that, it's just whoever Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala chooses. So whoever Allah chooses at that time, they do more khidmat for deen. So as I was saying about this hadith, which is slightly went away from the main topic of Hazrat Salman Farsi the Anhu. So he actually is mentioned in the commentaries that Hazrat Salman Farsi the Anhu, when he passed away, he was approximately 250 years old. Hazrat Salman Farsi the Anhu, when he passed away, he was approximately 250 years old. Now again, don't get the wrong idea that or he was on a wheelchair or he, was, he had a walking stick or he had 20 people as khuddams who would take him to the mosque. No. As mentioned in the Quran as well that when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives strong iman and faith and somebody when he does amal and actions, even though he may be in his 90s or hundreds or early hundreds, he still is fit as a 40-year-old. He still is strong as a 50-year-old. So that was the case with Hazrat Salman Farsi who even though he passed away when he was 250 years old, but he was still strong like a, a 50, 60-year-old. Why? Because he had the strength of Iman, Taqwa, he had Amal, he had actions inside him. Now, as I was saying about Hazrat Salman Farsi Danu, how he's linked with this hadith here, that he was actually a Christian before, so he, was, he would go to this particular priest, this particular church, you know, trying to find solace, trying to find, you know, itminan or some sukun. So he went to various priests and churches. He stayed there. He spent time with the priests, with the rabbis. So one of them told him that, look, uh, go to Yathrib, go to Medina Munawwara. Because the final prophet is going to soon converge to that particular blessed city. Then the priest told him three signs, told Hazrat Salman Farsid Anhu three signs, that if you find these three signs, then you know that this person is the final prophet and messenger of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now the three signs that priest told Hazrat Salman Farsid Anhu were number one, that this final prophet does not eat zakat, or he doesn't take zakat. Number two, he accepts gifts. And number three, between his shoulder blade is the mahre nubuwat, is the seal of prophethood. So when Hazrat Salman Farsidan who went to visit Absalom, the first day he presented some food to Absalom, said, Oh Prophet of Allah, this is zakat, can you take it? So Rasulullah said no. Then the next day he came 
and he offered some same food again but this time he said oh prophet of allah this is hadiyah this is gift so rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam took it and then the hadith goes on to say that hazrat salman farsi farsi anhu saw that Aap sallallahu alaihi wasallam's collar button was open so he kind of gestured to Aap sallallahu alaihi wasallam to lift his kameez up so that between his shoulder blades he can see the mahdi nabuwat so when Aap sallallahu alaihi wasallam lifted his kameez up then between his shoulder blades hazrat salman farsi anhu saw the mahri nubuwat uh, the seal of prophethood which had allah rasul muhammad on and as soon as uh, hazrat salman farsi anhu saw that he then realized that he's the final prophet and he converted to islam so that is this uh, detailed hadith of shamayi tirmizi about ab sallallahu alaihi wasallam's qurtan kameez but what we can gather is that his kameez was up to the wrist and also the neckline was up to the chest in another hadith of mustadrak hakim it's mentioned that rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam's kameez or kurta was halfway between his knees and his ankles in other words it was up to his shins now this then leads to a question that the kurta which we wear our pakistani indian shalwar kameez which is up to the knees or the jubbas the arab jubbas which you wear which is up to the ankles is that then the sunna dress are we wearing the sunna dress now the answer is that what we wearing is not exactly the sunna the sunna dress is that the kameez or the kurta you wearing has to be halfway between the knees and the ankles so in other words it has to be up to the shins for it to be sunnah now obviously that will then lead to some of you brothers asking the question that actually you know what we wearing is this something wrong then you know wearing up to the knees wearing up to the ankles is this something wrong is this something galat is this something incorrect now the answer is that what we wearing is not something wrong but in fact we are acting upon say a practice or a urf or a custom of the sulaha i.e. the pious people and the scholars and the ulama now what i'm trying to say is that you know when it comes to dress or garments the sharia is kind of very flexible in terms of it has left the clothes or the garments or the dress to the discretion of that particular nation or of that particular group of people i.e. whatever in that group or in that region is considered to be the dress of pious people which is considered to be the dress of ulama's and sulahas then wearing that would be considered to be something good something respectable so obviously looking at it from our own background that in india pakistan or like, like wearing these shalwar kameez up to the knees or any kind of long jubba up to the ankles is considered to be the clothes of the ulama is considered to be clothes of pious people in arabia say the jubba up to the ankles with the shawl on top is considered to be the clothes of the pious people so therefore wearing that so that you know copying or imitating them so that we have ummid and hope that in the hereafter because we try copying the clothes of the pious people we tried copying and imitating the clothes of the ulama that we have hope and ummid that we could obviously hang on to their coat tails and we will also enter jannah and paradise as well because there are occasions where remember that you may not be like them but you have some love as mentioned the hadith al mar'u ma'a man ahabba that a person will be with whom he loves kya matlab what does that mean it means that you may not be like you can't be a alim because you've gone a bit old you can't memorize hadith you can't learn tafsir anymore you can't go to a madrasa and learn. so you can't be a alim but you have the love or respect for a alim so it's mentioned that in the hereafter you will inshallah you will be raised alongside them and you will inshallah go to jannah with them as well
just remember the hadith which I uh, taught the other day a few days ago of uh, in Sunan al tirmizi under the section of Qiyamat and there's a hadith there where Absalom describes the Hosea Kothar you know the pond in, Jan, uh, in the hereafter so the hadith explains like this Hosea Kothar would be so big and so long it's mentioned that the cups around the Hosea Kothar will be equivalent to the number of stars in the sky and it's also mentioned in the hadith that the first people to drink from the Hosea Kothar and as mentioned the hadith that whoever drinks from the Hosea Kothar lam yazma abadan like he will never ever feel thirsty so it's mentioned that the first people to drink from the Hosea Kothar will be the fuqarai muhajirun i.e. the poor people and then Absalom describes the poor people, like the sifats. That number one, they wear messy clothing, dirty clothing. Number two, they don't wash their hair. So, so their hair is all over the place. They don't wash their hair. Number three, they don't marry or they did not marry wealthy women. Because sometimes what happens is that when somebody's poor, so just to like ease himself from poverty or financial difficulties, he gets married to a rich woman. You sometimes see that as well in it, like people getting married to women for the <coughs> visa, for the red passport and so on. So, you know, so, like, but in the hadith is mentioned that these poor men, if they wanted, they could have got married to rich women, but they said no. And number four, the fourth sifat, absolutely as a mention of the fuqara, is that doors are not open for them. In other words, when they knock on somebody's door begging for money or food, People don't open the doors for them. So these are the four sifats. Absalom mentioned the fuqara who will drink from the Hosea Kothar. Now then the hadith goes on to explain that Hazrat Umar who he says that my halat or my circumstances were such that I married a wealthy woman, a wealthy woman. My halat was such that because I was Amir al Mu'minin, people would open their doors for me. So I don't have to even knock on the door. The doors would always be open for me because I was Amir al-Mu'mini. So for these two things, I couldn't help it because halat circumstances were such here that I had to marry or I married a wealthy woman. Doors was open for me. But then for the other two, Hazrat Umar al who said that because I want to be from the very first ones to drink from the Hosea Kosa. And he wanted to copy and imitate the fuqarai muhajirun. <coughs> so what he did was that he would never wash his hair. And he would walk around wearing dirty and dusty clothing. He could have. Because obviously, as I was explaining, that he wanted to copy and imitate them. So, Absalom has mentioned the four qualities to be a fuqara. That you marry, uh, that you don't marry wealthy women. Doors are not open for you. So as Umar al is saying that for them too, I couldn't help it because halat was such that I married a wealthy woman. Halat was such that I was Amir al-Mu'mineen. Doors were open. But for the other two, are you wearing dusty clothing, dirty clothing, and also what not washing his hair? Has Umar al who maintained that. Why? Why did he do that for? Is as I just explained, Take because of that munasabat, just a bit, but that love he had, he could also be raised alongside the Fuqarai Muhajirun and he could also be from the first people to drink from the Hosea Kothar. So exactly same here as I mentioned with the clothing of the Ulama and Sulaha that we may not reach their level ever. We may not reach the pious level, uh, pious people level in terms of taqwa, piety, knowledge. But we hope that by wearing their clothing and so on, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will make it easy. It's also mentioned, Mona Ashraf Ali Tanu Rahimullah has mentioned in one of his uh, kitabs about the magicians, the magicians who were uh, competing with Musa alayhi salam. So Hazrat mentions in one of his books that when the time, when the day came, the Yawm Zina, the day of festival, where Musa alayhi salam was about to challenge the magicians of Fir'aun, it's mentioned that Musa alayhi salam, he was wearing a topi, he was wearing a hat, and I touched on it a couple of weeks ago that the wearing of the hat was the sunnah of every single prophet and messenger. So it's mentioned that he was wearing a hat and he was wearing 
the clothing of an alim or scholar, i.e. a kameez, something which was respectable. Hazrat also mentions that on that day, the magicians were also wearing the very same clothing as Hazrat Musa alayhi salam. They also were wearing a hat. They were also wearing a kameez and a kurta as well. And that's why when Musa alayhi salam defeated the magicians, what did the magicians do? They said, I believe in the Lord of Musa alayhi salam. Now, why, why did they do that for? Because obviously, if they were totally against Musa alayhi salam, even though they had seen a clear miracle, like Fir'aun saw a clear miracle, like Abu Jahl saw clear miracles, like Abu Lahab saw clear miracles, they wouldn't have believed in Musa alayhi salam. But what Hazrat writes, Ayman al rahimullah, writes is that because the magicians were wearing the same clothing as Musa alayhi salam, so what happened was that when they saw the miracle, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala softened their hearts and gave them tawfiq to accept iman. So this is like the, as I was saying, you know, taken out from the, the, the theme here that, you know, wearing the clothes of the pious people, inshallah, it has an effect on us. You know, it'll have an effect on our heart. It'll have an effect on our iman. And also, you know, hopefully we have umid that by following them or trying to copy them in, in any little things in their clothes in their small sunnahs that we could also you know hang on to their kote and we can also be granted jannah and paradise as well so that was a, f a few things with regards to just very quickly the next part i want to mention is about rasulullah's izar or trousers now there's a few th narrations about rasulullah's izar or trousers some hadiths mention that Absalom he purchased some izar, some trousers, but he did not wear it. Other hadiths say that he purchased trousers and izar, but he wore it. But generally speaking, what we can derive or gather is that Rasulullah generally speaking wore a lungi. So sometimes he may have worn uh, izar bottoms. But generally speaking, Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam wore a lungi. So the so obviously the the kameez or the kurta would be up to halfway between his uh, knees and ankles, and then underneath would be the the lungi which Ab sallallahu alaihi wasallam wear. Sometimes he would wear the izad, but most of the time it was the lungi which Ab sallallahu alaihi wasallam wore. Going back to the izad. Obviously, it's mentioned in a hadith that whether you're wearing an izar or a kameez or a kurta, the sunnah is, the best method is to have the izar or the kurta, whatever, halfway between the knees and the ankles. Yeah? Then Absalom mentioned that the ruhsa, i.e. jiski ijazat hai, is to lengthen the izar or the kurta up to the ankles and anything which goes below the ankles above the ankles sorry uh, below the ankles would be haram and lawful so basically what we can gather is that izars or kurta it should be halfway like up to the shins the ruhsad ruhsad means that jiski ijazat that okay it's not haram is up to the ankles and then anything below the ankles would be considered haram and lawful. Now I'm just going to touch on this particular point about having the trousers or izar or kurta below the ankles because there are some misconceptions about this particular ruling. Now the rule is that if somebody drags his izar or his bottoms, trousers, tracksuits, whatever he's wearing, jeans, below the ankles, if he's, doing it, if he's doing it intentionally, out of takabur, pride, arrogance, then that is considered to be makruya ta'nimi, severely disliked. And if he did it out of ghaflat, ghaflat meaning heedlessness or not realizing that the kurta has gone below or the izah has gone below, then it's makruya tanzihi. So if he did it intentionally, then it's makruya ta'nimi. If he did it or if he just essay hogia, 
without him realizing that it's makruwe tanzihi. Another rule to clarify here, this is where a lot of brothers get mixed up, is that many people think that this rule of having the trousers above your ankles is only for namaz. So you see many brothers, they'll come for namaz, they'll just like, uh, they pull it up. As soon as namaz finishes, they even intentionally pull it down and then they go out. This rule is for namaz keliye, also for namaz kibahi. So whether outside namaz or inside namaz, it doesn't matter. The rule is that the izar has to be above the ankles. Another rule to clarify here is that, again, some people say, some people say Murad, the Ahli Hadith brothers, what they say is that by you folding your izar above your ankles, then that's wrong. In other words, they say that you should have your izar cut in such a way or tailored in such a way that it's automatically above your ankles. And they say that if it's uh, below your ankles, then you're not allowed to fold it up. Like sometimes we do it if it's a long trouser, then we try to fold it up. They say, no, don't fold it up. Just leave it like that and pray namaz in that way. And the reason why they say that don't fold up your izar is they use this hadith from Sahih Muslim where the words of the hadith are that Prophet ﷺ has prohibited from folding your clothes. The hadith said, pro prohibited from folding the clothes. Now, this is a good example of the nuksan we see of people learning hadiths without a scholar, without a teacher. You know, people just look at translations of say Muslim in English, oh, folding the clothes, oh, that's haram, and then they go around and tell the youngsters, oh, bro, you're doing haram, or bro, or sis, you're doing haram, and so on. You know, this is the nuksan you get of learning without a teacher, learning or reading articles on the internet and then coming to your own conclusion without checking it or verifying it with an imam or a scholar. Now that hadith of Sayyid Muslim, I'll just explain it, where Absalullah said about folding the clothes. Folding the clothes, Absalullah said it in the context that when you go for sajda, people do that even nowadays as well, that if you're praying, say, salah outside, some people, they have this habit, they don't want to get their jubba dirty, they, want, they don't want to get their white kameez or kafni dirty what they do is that when they're going for sajda they lift their uh, kameez or their kurta up and they kind of fold it and then they go for sajda Absalom has said that is makru you shouldn't do that but what they do they apply for oh you can't then lift your uh, izar up as well so the answer to what they say is the hadith they're using from saying muslim is not for this for the izar it was Rasulullah said that for the situation about when you're going for sajda, then don't fold your jubba or your kameez up and do sajda on your izar and not to get your jubba dirty. Absalullah said, no, you should you know, let it get it dirty. You know, you're doing it for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And then to use that word of the hadith for the izar and you know, saying, oh, you can't fold it up and so on, then that is totally wrong and totally taken out of context. So in a nutshell, what I want to say is that with regards to uh, trousers in particular, it should be, again, the sunnah, the, pre the preferable way is uh, up to the shins. The rukhsa is up to the ankles, but anything below that would be considered to be unlawful and haram. May Allah give us the tawfiq to Akhtamaz bin Sayyid wa Akhidu da'wan.